can't change events in my life. I can't change some things. I can't change the fact that I'm born black. I can't change the fact that my mom was a single mom. I can't change the fact that my dad really spent time with me. I can't change that, you know. Um, but I, I can I can change the way I respond to it. Welcome to the Passion Behind the Art Show. It's all about diving in with individuals to learn the story behind their passion. It's your host, Daryl Pinnock. Well, today I want to welcome Dr. Cecil Wright to the Passion Beyond the Art show. Um, We've known each other a long time and he's doing a lot of great things over there in the Bronx. So I just wanted to give him a shout out and um, interview him on the show. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Cecil. Yes. Dr. Wright, or should I say? <laughs> Go way back, man. This is good. This is good. <laughs> I, I paid for the doctorate, you know, so this is good. <laughs> so you have a lot going on, but yes. I know you you have a very um, amazing story. And how did this whole journey before the book, before the the great organization like how did this journey start for you you know i think i think for me this journey really started many many years ago growing up in jamaica you know i came from a pretty much working class um family neighborhood you know you get in the morning you get out there you have to go and take your chickens and goats and and all the animals so you, you you're up early so i have certain work ethics for me that was just that have always been instilled to my parents and um, and then that I think where it started from, and traveling. I guess when I before we get into the book part, I guess I you know did well, went to school back home, and and um, just keep on working. I didn't know anything else. My family didn't give us a choice. You had to get up in the morning at six, take care of the goats, make sure they're fed, and the pigs are all fed before you even get a chance to eat. So, you know, I know about working hard, and I think in my entire life, I've always just believed that hard work just breeds success. And, you know, it's not immediate. You know, there's no gratification of immediate immediate expectancy when it comes to success. But if you keep on putting, you know, your wheel, um, your shoulder to the wheel, um, one day that wheel's going to turn. And you never know what's going to pick up steam. And the folks don't. Folks don't understand that for me, sometimes picking up steam, it took 20 years before I pick up steam and um, still need more steam, but at least, you know, I can see the engine getting cranked up, you know? True, true, true. So I've heard bits and pieces of this story of you coming to America. I would love to hear the full story of how this journey you come into America. Yeah, well, I, I think... I, so it started, it's a little complicated in the sense that I went to um, high school in Jamaica, Stets, Southern Elizabeth Technical High School, and I was did pretty well. I was deputy head boy and went out to Stets, went to work in, um, in a bank for a couple of years, workers' bank. And during that time, I, my best friend got killed. Oh. And, um, you know, and I, I didn't feel comfortable. Um, not that was violence around, but I just felt it was time to time for something new. This guy was my best friend for life, and I just want to move on to something else. So I got a visa, a business visa, went to Canada. And while I was in Canada, I um, at a time in Canada, I, I liked Canada. It, it felt clean. You know, I lived with my aunt and, and a great family. But I knew, you know, the story we know growing up is that if you go to New York, um, moving to New York is a place to be, you know, and, and, and there's a saying that if, you know, if you make it New York and make it anywhere, right. I'm like, you know, I got to go to New York. I got to find where New York is. So I remember I live with my aunt and I tell them I want to go to the U.S. And, um, and they say, it's a bad idea. Don't go anywhere. And I said, listen, I met this guy, you know, I was in Canada like three months and I met this guy and he tell me I could get you there. I, you know, you know, I can, I, I can get. Let me make one disclaimer. I'm a citizen, so I'm safe, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they can't come for me, baby. <laughs> right. um, but um, the, the, so I was there, and I decided that I wanted to take this journey. And he said to me, well, it's very risky um, about taking this journey. And I said, um, he said, he can bring me across. I have to sit in the, in, in the front of the, 
of a car and act like an American and speak like an American. Now, understand this, a country boy, right? <laughs> From St. Elizabeth, right? <laughs> Whose accent is mighty thick, still thick accent, right? Right. Um, it's supposed to sit in the front of a car when they ask you a question, I'm supposed to answer like American, right? So I, I moved to the, the hotel he wanted to stay at. I'm at the hotel. He came, he saw me, I gave him whatever he's supposed to get, you know, to get to bring me across. And, um, and then right in the time, he said, okay, let's sit in the front of the car and speak like American. So the first I set up my mouth, he said, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, so what's going to happen? He said, the only thing you have to do, you have to go in the trunk of the car. I'm like, and the trunk? He's like, yeah. And I said, all right, well, um, I think about it for a second. And, you know, this was 22 years ago. You're young. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, your, your mind is not... You're not, um, you don't see danger right. as you see danger. If you ask me now, the answer would definitely be no. But that time I was, I was um, fearless wow. and, and, and in some regards didn't have the same understanding of the danger I put myself in. So anyway, we got in the car and um, we drove close to the border of, um, from Ontario heading into, into close to the border of Detroit. And then he stopped and said, okay, you got to get in the, in the car, in the trunk. So he put him in the trunk. Close the trunk, and there's a, there's a spot open where my I could breathe a little bit. So I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the trunk, and, I'm, and and he's driving, and then all of a sudden, I'm there, and I start to see myself like I'm dead. I start to see my casket. I start passing out because he told me it was going to be 15 minutes to get over the border. At he said there was an accident or traffic is about four to five minutes. So now I'm sweating profusely. <laughs> Now um, I'm, I'm water dripping from anywhere. I'm wet. I'm seeing people like bring my casket and say, what did he do? Why did he do this? You know, I'm seeing my mom is crying and I'm like, oh my God, this. And the last, last thing I remember was me just imagine all the bad things happening. Right. And I passed out. Mm. And um, next thing I know, I woke up with someone stopping me in the face and wet me with water <laughs> and um, got up. He said, you're here, you're here. But he was so frightened that he was supposed to get some funds from me. He's like, no, 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 no. Just, just, just give me half of it. Just, just give me half of it, you know? So, <laughs> and uh, that was it. So I, I now I'm in Detroit. I got on a Greyhound bus, to the Greyhound bus, and travel on the Greyhound bus and get off at Times Square mm-hmm. in Manhattan. Right. Got off of Manhattan. Um, I had one person I knew was living in the Bronx. Mm-hmm. And I, it's, a, it's a young lady I know from back home. Had her number. She promised me when I was in Canada that when I get here, don't worry, I can come and stay with her, not a big deal, and the family and so forth. I got off at Times Square, it was early morning, put my bag down the floor, like everyone at the time, and just slept, I didn't know better. Um, it was in the morning, I heard like footsteps running, like before, the, like four o'clock, footsteps running, I realized I was lying next to homeless people who I thought was regular <laughs> folks. I got up, got my stuff, got on the subway, and took the subway all the way from Times Square to 241st and White Plains Road, the last stop. Last the stop. Last stop, baby. <laughs> and I got off there, called the young lady, no answer. Wow. No answer. No answer. So she did answer the phone, and I, um, I ended up, you know, walking back from 241st to 216th Street, and there's a motel there. It might still be there. And I remember going in there and paying them either thirty dollars or twenty five dollars for a night, and I stayed there. And I realized now I'm in real trouble I'm in America, and I had like three hundred dollars in my pocket and nowhere to go. Mm. And I said, you know what? I asked a guy if he could rent a place two weeks. He said two weeks, and he gave me a discount. I forgot what I paid him, and I stayed in there for two weeks. And um, during that two weeks period, I eventually. I try. I remember the, the barbershop across the street. I, I never cut here in my, my <laughs> life before. I went to the shop and tell the guy, I'm a barber, because I had to work, man. Phone's getting low. I'm a barber. He said, hey, we you licensed? He said, I have to get my license. He said, I don't have my license, but I cut in Jamaica. All the lies I told. And then he gave me a clipper and said, okay, um, cut this kid. And the first time I, I used the clipper, he's like, he cursed, like, get out of my shop, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, you have no i you have no idea, man. The stuff I've been through, but um, but but that was the start, man, of of um 
of a new of a new journey and um and you know the story just just goes from there wow man that is that is some story man that is crazy like that trunk ride that had to be something else for you to pass out and like and yeah you, man and, and you're right like when you're young you don't be like Sometimes you don't have to spend too much time thinking. You're just right. like, let's do it. <laughs> absolutely, 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 absolutely. So let's let's touch base on the book, um, Twenty One Ways to Freedom. Um, yes. How did that come about? So so eventually, you know, when I got here and um, and I started, uh, oh, I stopped here for a while in in, in the Bronx. I um, started moving around the Bronx, trying to find a way to to make a living cleaning people's houses and selling vacuum cleaners door to door, everything I could. And this, a friend of mine, um, who's still a good fr friend of mine, Wayne Williams, you know Wayne, go to church together. I walked into a McDonald's store and gone to the road and I saw a familiar face. It's the first familiar face I saw in the U.S. after like four years in the U.S. The first wow. person ever known back from Jamaica. I'm like, Wayne, what's going on, man? And he said, he's good, he's good, you know. And um, we went over to... Um, he invited me to church, and I went to uh, a church in the Bronx um, on White Plains Road, um, just for privacy's sake. I don't want to disclose people's information. So at White Plains Road, we went there, and um, I started going to church there. And while I was there in church, I then, uh, you know, met my wife, and, and, and we got married, and, you know, still married to her for 19 years, and have some beautiful, um, beautiful rugrats running around, you know, so that's a good thing. But I, so she got married, I got my papers, became a, a resident of the state. Somewhere along the line, um, when I went to obtain my status in the system from being a, a temporary resident to permanent resident, um, I couldn't prove how I entered the country. Mm. So here I've been, here I have, here I have my green card, went back to school, got a bachelor's degree, um, six credit for my master's degree, I have my kids, my daughter is um, four and five years old. I, you know, I have a lovely wife and, you know, I'm a good citizen. I'm working full time and everything else. And I went to change the green card from, um, you know, a temporary status to permanent status. And I could approve um, how I got in the country. By, it's, it's called your port of entry. Right. And um, so that was an issue. And next thing I know, they revoked my green card and asked me to leave the country. Mm. I'm like, wow, to leave? I'm like, this is all I know for the past, you know, 15 right. years. Now right. I'm here, and, you know, my kids are here, my wife's a citizen, I'm here. So I didn't take it so seriously until one day I'm home. It was December 26. It's back in there, I think it's called. They have the Christmas. Right. Back in Jamaica, December 26, I'm home. About 3.30 a.m. in the morning, there's a big bang on the door. Bang, bang on the door. Went to the door that said, police, police, police. It wasn't police. It was Immigration Enforcement Services, right. ICE. So um, they came in and they arrested me. And they and they put me, um, bring me to a detention center over New, over New Jersey. So I was locked up there for 21 days. So hence wow. the, the, the book, 21 Days to Freedom. And um, But you know, Dara, the most important thing about those 21 days is that it, it the first seven days that I went in. Well, the first day, I was losing my mind. Mm. No, the first day I said, you know, this is crazy. But it's by the seventh day, I'm like, oh, this is really crazy. I'm locked up in here. There's guys in there who was locked up for 18 months, nine months, 10 months. And I'm like, this is going to be a mess. And, um, and I couldn't understand how I could find myself in this position. Um, but, you know, but no sin goes unpunished. You know, the fact right. I came here, le came here legal it put me in the position where I gotta pay for it. Right. So, 21 days, and about day eight, about eight days I'm in there, I looked around and I said to myself, what am I doing? I'm like, how? Oh, I mean, what? How much fun it would be for me to pass the time, irrespective of how long I wanna be here, to interview everyone who is, is also detained with me? <laughs> so I grabbed my paper. And I started interviewing people and taking notes. I'm like, okay, so where are you from? How you got here? So I started capturing all these stories, all these different types of stories, and wow. um, just asking people how they get here, uh, where they're from. Man, I have some stories in that book. is crazy. I got people. I've known people who get here in, in, in plane engines. 
in the engine of a plane. I've got people who came in, in suitcases. Right? You know, I've had, I've had people who were detained in there with me um, who owned two and three gas stations. Wow. Right? And I hear all these stories, and I start to document the story. Um, so this is like, after about a week of documenting the story, the, 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 the guards realize I'm taking stories. I'm in, interviewing people. So people come to me, and if they don't speak English, they bring the interpreter. I'm, taking <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like documenting stuff in there. And then because of that, it got me in trouble. So they, oh no, this guy's here to cause trouble. So they take me out of there and put me in an isolation cell. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's called the shoe. They put me to the shoe, right? As a punishment. Mm. So I was in the shoe, uh, spent a day in the shoe, and came back out. They took most of the original papers from me. I had some papers until someone explained to me the reason they took the papers because the paper had their, the, it, it was, um, it was, um, New Jersey Detention Center, it was it, but the name of the center was on the paper, so they owned the paper. Mm -hmm. But there's a library in there, so in the library, I go in there and get blank papers, plain blank papers, and start writing in those papers. So they could take those from me. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I wrote about about 150, you know, loose leaf of papers, and when I came out, um, it wasn't about publishing a book. For me, it was more about. I wanted my kids who are born here, who are American citizens, all of them to know their dad's journey. Because in life, you know, we grew up as African Americans, we get to where we are based on stories. You know, stories got us true. You know, it's a story of forefathers coming from Africa, um, heading all the way across, you know, the, the, the Pacific Ocean um, to get here and became slave and we fought through slavery and we overcame slavery and, you know and, and and we're proud of who we are but somewhere along the line once we became free we no longer track our stories the same way so our story is very generalized and I wanted my kids uh, whether it's 50 years from now 100 years from now um, any child that I have um, or my grand great grandchildren could go back and said, let me read about Cecil Wright, how he got here. And wow. hopefully that story will help to propel them. And so I was, trying to, I was just trying to write my own story. I wrote it out, wrote the journey, plus those other men, journey in the book who I interviewed while I was detained. Mm. And, um, and a friend of mine said to me, um, man, this is a crazy book. Why don't, you, why don't you publish it? I'm like, publish it? Why don't you tell a story? And then as we're beginning to go through this kind of um, uh, dogmatic political climate in the last couple of months with, with the whole historic election mm -hmm. that we just had, um, and I became a citizen, I said to myself, you know what, when we talk about the immigrant story and those who came here illegal, sometimes we believe that all illegal people who came here, they came here to do wrong. Right. But some of us who came here illegally just came here for hope and for the dream that this great country gives us. Right. And I wanted to tell that story. So when I became a citizen, I contacted my lawyer. He said, well, if you're a citizen now, you can go ahead and publish the book. Tell the story. So mm. that's how the book came about. And that's how, um, you know, we, we've sold a couple hundred copies as well. And um, people are still going on you know, to Amazon and buying the book, which is, which is great. And, um, you know, so that led to... So that led to the book story. That's crazy. I mean, um, I was I was wondering, like, if you did check with, like, a lawyer, because, like, all this information that you're sharing about how you came here, like, but yeah. it's, it's good that you took the time to find that out. Yeah, well, well, I well, I had my own attorney um, who, got, who helped me when I was detained, and once I became a citizen, um, you know, everything disclosed. Everything was, was disclosed from A to Z, um, and, you know, that is irrevocable based on um, the, the legality of it. So that, you know, that kind of solidified where I was. And I felt, felt a need, an obligation to share the story because share the story will help other people who's going to the same situation right. to understand that there's hope, mm -hmm. to understand that there's, there is dream, um, there, there are possibilities in this country. And, um, and one of the things I said to folks all the time is one thing I, I was very, very sure of in my time, um, even when I was illegal in this country, was, was, to, was to do everything legal. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I understand you 100%. You know? You know? So, you know, I won. I started going to school. I paid for myself until I was able to get my tuition um, right. through 
compelled. You know, um, I've always believed uh, a strong man of faith and believe that um, the man above is is to control my future and, and my life and, and, and my destiny. And I stayed in church. You know, um, I, I did everything I could possibly do um, to make sure I didn't have any bad encounter with the law. Right. And, um, um, to that would escalate my, my, my situation. So, you know, if you follow the law, and even now, you know, in, in terms of illegal immigration in this country, if you are a good citizen, even though you're illegal, you're fine. But if you're illegal and you have issues problems. and you have problems, then they will they will send you home. And honestly, they should send you home right. if you have if you can't follow laws, right? right. Um, so you know, I am a big a big pro proponent of um, making sure that people actually uh, have access as much as possible to the right information and that's why you know come my, my colleagues and i um in the bronx have gone in several book tours um churches across the bronx where we have immigration forums to tell my story and their attorney of law the immigration attorney and we go to several churches in the bronx and in other uh, boroughs to tell um what do you do if you're legal and you get stopped by you know by a police officer you know um how should you react um what, what, what are ways you can help to rectify the situation you're going through right now mm -hmm. to get yourself back on the right track? So, you know, it's, it's all good stuff now, but it wasn't all good then. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> you know? right, right, right. That's, that's, I mean, it's a good story, man. I mean, some of the stuff um, we go through as immigrants to kind of just get things right here in this country, like people would not be able to <laughs> imagine. That's what I that's <laughs> but, understand. So um, I know it's not always easy, as you've articulated, but who would you say your support system, that, that, that group of people that you know when Cecil needs to pull energy from, to pull that good energy from, who would you say that group of people is? You know, I, I think that I've always had several mentors in my life, you know, at different stage. I definitely believe that along the line, you're going to find people are in your life for a season right. and some might be in your life for all seasons. Right. The issue with us sometimes, you know, when we have someone in our lives uh, for a short period of time, we think they weren't there for a reason that might move on to something else, but God put them there for a reason and they're there for a certain time. Um, my support system have always been a very, 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 uh, a much more spiritual and much more religiously grounded, uh, connective um, than people think. Um, I don't wear my spirituality on my sleeve. Um, so my, my supposition has always been, I'm a strong believer that the man who created me didn't create me to fail. And, and uh, so that is, I've always done that. I'm not created to fail. You know, I'm, 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 an, I'm a perfectly orchestrated being, you know, from a man who chose me with a name and, and a place and time and give me the resources to do what I do. So I kind of wake up every single morning knowing that I have that supreme confidence in, 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 the, in, in a supreme power that governs all things. Right. Uh, so when I have obstacles that comes along the way, um, I, just, I, I call it temporary setbacks. And it's only setting me back for a bigger setup. Um, so that's, that, that's part of my, my, my biggest support system. Um, beyond my immediate family, my wife and my children, um, who knows me every single day, I think for me has always been my mom and my uncle. Um, one is because I'm a, I'm a boy from a single mother. That's all I know. Um, and my mother have always been there with me. She lives with me now, um, have always lived with me ever since we got married because I'm a strong believer in having different generational living in the same household. Mm. It, teaches, it, it teaches a lot of things. Wow. It, ha it helps with continuity. Um, it also... Um, helps with, 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 with sharing stories and lifestyles and, and laughter. It, keeps, it gets the younger one to, be, to understand what we've been through, and it keeps the older one young. You know? So my mother having the chance to see my son grow up and run around her and chasing her, and um, he's laughing and, and not understanding her in her Jamaican language sometimes. <laughs> it, it's a lot of fun. So she has always been my big support system. My uncle passed away last year. Um, grew me, um, has always been my rock, you know, has been someone who, um, who, who believed in me before I believed in myself, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, 
it, it's it's it has been tough since he passed away. But he, you know, he's um, he, you know, he's the one who instilled in me to have a vision beyond sight. You know, to look beyond the immediate and always understand that there's things that is that's a lot more profound than what we see. And um, and we should only look at our eyes, and we should only think physically about things, but um, keep things in a perspective that has a bigger view, a broader view, and a broad objective. He's taught me that well, and um, has also taught me, you know, really that life comes with challenges, but whatever challenge that you face in life comes an opportunity, and you have to kind of gear yourself to choose which would you take, be overcome by the challenge, or being advanced to the opportunity that you have. So, you know, he taught me that we live by a simple uh, philosophy that E plus R equal O, event plus response equal outcome. I can't change events in my life. I can't change some things. I can't change the fact that I'm born black. I can't change the fact that my mom was a single mom. I can't change the fact that my dad really spent time with me. I can't change that, you know, um, but I, I, can, I can change the way I respond to it. Mm. I can change how I respond. And my response to the fact that my mother's single mom is that, yes, I want to make her the best single mom ever. Right. Um, you know, I, I want to respect her. I, I want to thank her for what she did for me, for taking care of me when no one else did. I can't respond to, um, I, I can't change the fact I was born black, but I can respond to being black by being black and proud of who I am, right? Um, and helping others. So your response equals your outcome. And if your response is positive, it's most likely your outcome is positive based on all mathematical calculations, right? So, you know, I, I kind of stick with that a little bit and just be very upbeat and positive about stuff. And then the, the last, in, in my circle, the last, uh, I think, the last two people I would love to mention in my circle beyond my family and my wife um, is my best friend. I have a friend um, for the past um, 14 years um, from the U.S. Virgin Island. I, I met him, Sherman. Uh, we call him Sherman Jiggy Brown. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we met in college together 14 years ago. Um, I, I love to brag and say, I introduced him to his wife. So he has to do exactly what I say. Um, <laughs> that's with me, right? Because I, I, I'll talk all his dirt if he messes with me, right? <laughs> but, um, but he's my, you know, Sherman, Sherman has been my partner in crime for 14 years. And, um, and you know, we, we motivate each other. We we're focused with a passion um, to help others. And we spend most of our life helping others to be the best they can be. And in return, God has helped us to be what he wants us to be. And that has all been what, what, you know, what we do. So he's a big support structure, um, support system. Um, you know, we share, you know, everything together. Um, besides the business that we have together, uh, we're really kind of a tell it all, um, be very frank, open with, with each other. I don't consider my friend. I consider my brother. Um, okay, he do some, I do some nonsense sometimes that he doesn't like. He do some nonsense sometimes that I don't like. And But he's going to get it straight from me. You know, when you're off track, you're off track. You know, get back on track, you know. Um, when the moments are, are there when, you know, we're not doing well, he's going to pick me up, you know, and say, listen, let's do this, let's do that. You know, when I was detained for 21 days, um, he was there every weekend. Every weekend, mm. every Sunday, I bring my wife up to make sure to check, to look at me, to make sure I'm fine. Um, he's the one who kept the kids together and said, kids, um, oh, y your father's away working. You know, <laughs> they didn't know the story. Right. You know, they thought I was away working, not knowing that I, I was detained. So he did a lot of good stuff. And, you know, as a really, really true brother. Um, so he's, you know, really been there. And, you know, and then the last person for me, I think, across the board, that have always been there for me in terms of mentorship and support system has always been any pastor on the which I serve. So I'm a very big believer in, in staying under authority. Right. Uh, um, so I, I'm a strong believer. You know, I've had great, great um, pastors of work with the past. You know, I had, you know, in the Bronx, we had, you know, you know, Living Hope had Pastor Meeks and then Reverend Hildo in Quintona Church of God. And, and you know, and then... You know, I now, for the last 10 years, have been on the leadership of, of Robert Mullins out in, 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 um, in Massapequa, New York, Long Island, and, um, and super man of God, you know. And, you know, we play golf together. We hang out together all the time. And really, 
um, someone who you know is going to look at you through the eyes of forgiveness. Hmm. Because what happened to us in mo- a lot of times, D, is we get to a stage where we are, we as sometimes we're as human beings, we tend easily, we judge easily and prosecute easily. And we don't really look in the terms of forgiveness. And I think a lot of times when I have conversation with him and talk to him, he's always looking for a reason to, to forgive someone for something that they even have not done yet. You, wow. you know? You know? Wow. Uh, so that for me has taught me so much, you know, taught me the world of forgiveness, the world of understanding that it's not that if we fail, but when we fail. Mm. And are you willing to to help someone else uh, or to forgive someone when they fail for what they have done and, and where they need to be. So um, that's my support structure. And, um, and, you know, and the thing also for me is, you know, in terms of keeping me going, a lot of times I don't get myself too caught up. I never get too high. I'm never too low. I just, I'm a strong believer in keeping a clear, steady drive because if you fluctuate, if you go up and down, and sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're, you know, it's not, it's not that I don't have issues or problems that come my way, but I've always take them in certain, it, 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 as, as, a, as a learning journey for me. I've never become so overtaken by anything where, you know, it's so crazy. I'm, I'm shutting off from people. I don't believe that. And I've never become so crazy where, too big. Things are so good where, you know, I'm shut off from people, you know, keep a very balanced approach for me. It always work, you know? Awesome. 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 So as you mentioned, um, Sherman, aim high. What is aim high? Ah, man. <laughs> aim high. Aim high, man. Aim high is what we live for, man. Aim high. Aim high is our tool, man, of, of help changing lives, you know, giving back, giving back. Um, we got lucky in the fact that we found each other early, 14 years ago, and we're able to motivate each other to go back to school and get bachelor's degree, master's degree, and 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 and, and I went back to my doctorate. And uh, his his joke is that he needs his doctor is in common sense. Um, so, <laughs> but um, but we motivate each other. And a couple of years ago, um, Sherman, from all my from me to Sherman, he has always been one of the most um, powerful empowerment speaker I've ever met in my life. Oh. And so is his thinking and his conversation, the way he view things and, and some of his own obstacles that he has been through has positioned him to be the authority in terms of talking about certain topics and, and, and certain life's journey. So, so aim high, it's a, it's a combination of, um, that empowerment theory the empowerment tool that we help to change lives, coupled with the passion I had for helping the young black males. And um, that passion came about nine years ago. Um, I started what's called Male Empowerment. So this is an annual conference where I would bring in, you know, 600 kids from all across New York State. And those kids then would, I would invite mentors like you, myself, and other people to come in and sit at a table and talk to these guys. The first year I did it, in 2004, we had 200 kids. Wow. Ever since that, the male employment has gone to 650 kids at every annual event that we have with 100 mentors from all across the country. And um, so that's what pushed me to get my doctorate. So my doctorate really looked at my dissertation topic is lesson learned from college-educated employed black males. Well, why some of us, like you, myself, Sherman, and all the other guys, Dr. Laws, that I know, why are we so progressive? Why are we always thinking about the next step? Um, what makes us the go-getters? And for those who are not go-getters, what's stopping them? So mm-hmm. my, my study looked at all of that. And so we combined the research that we had along with all the empowerment theories and, and Sherman ability to kind of um, be the voice and, and become the empowerment speaker to form what's called AIM High Empowerment Institute. So AIM High is a weekly series that Sherman started a couple of years ago. And we use the AIM High coupled with the, all the stuff from dissertation and the institute to, to form the AMI Apartment Institute. Okay. And the idea is to eradicate dropout rates um, in local high schools, um, to be a, a voice, um, to create access 
Uh, we currently have three institute open in three different high school campuses, and the plan is to um, is to scale that up. In a couple of months, um, the institute will be fully online, so people who live in different places, different states, can actually go on and have access to all our videos, access to all our PowerPoints, access to all of the materials um, that we use to train these young men. But it, it has been a real journey with the Institute, man. We see, we have people from Yemen, people from Jamaica, Trinidad, from all over the, you know, um, from um, South America, from all over the continent, uh, who came to the Institute. And, you know, we have, we have guys through the Institute who is now um, in a police academy, um, oh. police officers. We have guys who's in real estate, who's buying buildings. We have guys uh, who are teachers. We have guys who um, is in um, seminary, you know, um, who the chairman of our board, actually, which is um, Andre Sam Samuel, was um, a peer mentor, a member of the Abraham Palmer Institute, finished his bachelor's degree, and now is doing his, his master at Princeton Seminary to become a, a minister. Um, and has traveled to, you know, to Africa, you know, to do missionary work, you know. So these are the kind of um, gentlemen that we're, we're helping to, to inspire. And the hope is, um, is to get someone like you, man, down there in Atlanta to, um, to, to be involved and, and, and probably um, get you on board and open an institute one of the schools down there and, and, and be a voice and, and the rock farm so young men can have a place to um, to turn to when they're in need, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it sounds good, man. It's like whatever you and Sherman kind of came together and built, y'all extend it now to other yeah. people. It's kind of like what y'all experienced with each other. You tried to build something around that to share that yeah. same energy with other people, you know, and that's yeah. pretty you awesome. Know, the, w w one of the things um, that we do in the Institute, um, you know, it's funny, that we don't, for every mentor that work with us and all the schools, we call them coaches that work with us, which is crazy, we don't even interview people or look at their resume. We don't need a resume for you if you want to work at Institute, um, for you to be a mentor. All we ask to do is to tell us your story. Okay, here's the issue, is that when people say people like you and myself, and I go places all the time, um, I travel all across the, the world, luckily enough to do different things. I'm heading to Kenya on July 6th. Um, for uh, my second trip there, I've been here for 10 days. Um, I'm doing, uh, this time I'm, go, I'm leading a, a missions team there with 13 of my colleagues to work at a school, do some construction work and do some ministry work while we're there. I've traveled to all the Caribbean islands and, 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 and you know, I've written a book and all those things. So when people hear that, they hear the good part about Cecil. Oh, he does this. He's an adjunct professor. Mm -hmm. You know, he traveled here. You know, he's done this. Oh, he's a beautiful family. But what they don't know is that the Cecil they see in the suit was the same one who's cleaning people's houses in the Bronx. The Cecil in the suit now who has, you know, kids live in the island and decent homes and travel the world is the same Cecil who was driving cabs in the Bronx. The same Cecil who was illegal in the Bronx. The same Cecil who had to walk from 233rd Street to Jerome Avenue to get on the four train to get to school because I didn't have bus fare to go to school. I was finals. And I didn't want to miss my final exam. Right. The same Cecil who who uh, who know what it means to to eat corned beef and white rice for two weeks straight every single night. Yeah, man. When I use the bathroom, the bathroom said moo. <laughs> so 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 it's the same Cecil. So. When we ask the people to work with us in the Institute is that what we're trying to do is to get people to tell their story. Because you can't mentor a kid. You can't get me through anything if you don't have a story. Right. If you've never done anything, don't talk to me. If your life has been so good where you got it all made, you're not the sort of person I want to be involved in the Institute. Tell kids how you fail and mm -hmm. why you fail. Because these kids know when you're fake. Right. It's true. I want to. I want to see with the Benz outside and the Beamer outside, your car, or your Toyota, or Nissan, whatever you're driving outside, and you pulled up in your suit. They're thinking when they see you, if you tell them your story, I will tell you, bro, what they see, they see themselves in you. Because right. when I see them and the way they act, now I see myself. I see myself in them. I see someone who lacked hope. I see someone who, some point in time in my life, who was wondering why would I, why would I become someone who wasn't sure, 
someone who who um whose whose nicknames were Papa. That means I was supposed to be poor. Who nicknamed in my when I was, became thirty was Goofy. That means I was dumb. Someone who was fifteen years old couldn't speak because I I stutter a lot, mm. right? So I was that person, right? I was a person who who, who were in KFC after being in this country and got my papers. Didn't go back to school right away. I was in KFC flipping chicken for years until I'm on a plane going home. And a guy on a plane with my classmate in high school. And he's like, Sister, what you, what you do with yourself? I'm like, I'm good, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I was, ashamed, I was ashamed to tell him that I was working in KC flipping chicken. And I went to Jamaica with my daughter and gave my daughter to my mom. And come back to New York. I went straight back to school. I never stopped until five years ago when I earned my doctorate degree. Because I didn't want to have the feeling that I didn't do the best I could have done. Mm-hmm. Well, when I tell kids my story... They realize that, oh my God, I fail, I got up, I started, I fail, I got up, I started, I fail, I got up, I started, you know, and if you, if you can, um, if you can, if you can get to that stage where you tell your story and you share your story with them, sooner or later, these kids are going to start to see themselves in you and realize that they can also be the best they can be only a matter of time. I'm not giving up on any kid I meet in the street, man. I'm telling you. I don't give up on them. They know me. And I tell them, when we meet these kids sometime, they have to sign a contract. And the contract is that for the next four or five years, you're going to do what I say. I'm going to help you to get you where you need to be. And, you know, I've, I've gone to people's homes and knock on their doors and ask, why are you not in school? Uh, parents know. The parents know that if their kid is in, is in AMI Apartment Institute, Brown and I could show up anytime, anywhere. We have a right to show up on your block to see how you live your life. I'm going to pull up. We're going to pull up on your block to see what's going on. Because our job is to let you know we want to be there for you. You understand? Right. Because these kids go get into gangs because they don't have a support system. True. You know? You know, they gangs out there and uh, adamantly recruiting them every single day. In order for us to be successful with these guys, we have to be the same thing. And the bottom line is this. We're doing it because of humanity. Because our job is if we can build a generation where we respect each other and uplift each other, our whole the idea of young men of color will be totally changed. Willie Lynch talk about, you know, writing this book about how to become a slave, right? Our job as 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 educators and, and transformers and, 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 and life changers is to begin to write a new story. And we might not be able to change the world, Daryl. Probably not. But I promise one thing. I'm going to change my family, my community. I'm going to give the best I can give exactly where I'm at every single day. Because by doing so, I'll inspire someone else to do the same thing. And we know what happened. It only take a spark. It only take one spark, man, to start a fire. Dude, man, you've been, like, dropping knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> It's been amazing, man. I just have one more question, and I mean, you've shared a lot. Um, very inspiring, man. Like seriously, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, this has been inspiring. Yeah, man. That I I would love to, uh, you know, I one of these days, but I'll 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 hook you up with Sherman. You can bring him on, and you know, and um, he will talk a lot. He he's gonna talk a lot of stuff about me. That's not true. Um, right, but um, <laughs> I'll make sure I'll make sure I get connected. I'm going to bring him on. All right, man. Um, let me just hit you with the last question, and then we're done. Um, so you've given a lot of advice, but can you give me Jack one advice that you would like to give someone who feels like they're the odds are stacked against them? You know, they feel like they just can't find a way, or you know, or just someone that how did you keep pushing through through all of what you've went through? But, you know, I, I, I said this, two things. One, um, for some people, it's a little different because when you're a man of faith, it's, it's, it's powerful. Um, you know, I've lived my life. Um, so I'll give it two, from two perspectives. One, um, as a Christian, um, and my faith is being a Christian, and it's, it's, it's somewhere in the Bible it says to live as Christ and die as a gain, right? So I've always believed that I have two options. If I'm living, I'm living for Christ, give my best. Not perfect, I'm a man of the flesh, but always give my best. And if I die, I gain, because if I die, I'll be with him. So that's kind of a, a no-brainer for me. Um, I'm a strong believer in, in knowing that he brought me this far not to fail, 
You know, I, I just strongly, I get up every single day. And um, if there's one tip I could give someone who's going through a tough time, who I believe that would help you, is that I count small wins. Um, Sherman would tell you, I'm the sort of guy who goes in the room, in a conference room or uh, in every meeting that we've had, and I have one phrase, and my phrase is always, get on base. Just get on base. If mm. you're on base, someone will drive you home. If you're on base, someone is going to, you can steal second base if you need to. Yeah, someone's going to bunt you over. If it's a home run, we clear the base. So my job is always getting base. I don't look for the big home run. I don't look for the big hits. And most people sometimes, they think about, you know, I got to just get this big job. Well, guess what? Uh, my, my first job at college was at front desk, you know, and been through the ranks from front desk all the way to a dean. Um, you, know, you know, my first job in the U.S. was cleaning people's houses. You know, now if I want, I could have, I could have someone clean my house. Right. So the bottom line is this. We just got to get on base, count small wins, small wins. And along the way, celebrate each other's victory. So because what happened to us sometime is that when we go through tough things that other people are winning, we think their winning is our failure. Right. And that's not so. Their win is our win. You know, um, you know, I said to Brown all the time, Brown while we were at college, you know, was making a tremendous amount of money while I was just struggling for years. And But every time I he wins, I win. I celebrate his wins. All my colleagues, I celebrate other people win because I know if they're winning, it's only a matter of time before I start winning too. Right. Right? So celebrate each other win. doesn't matter where you are. Don't be, don't be a sore loser if someone got a job and you still unemployed. You know, don't be a sore loser because someone moved to another state and you're still in the Bronx. Do what you do where you can do it because sooner or later, if you can be the best you can be where you are, you'll be elevated at the next level. You know, you can, you, he won't give you much to manage until you learn to manage little. You understand? And so that's for me, it's just, it's just kind of celebrate other people win. And, and my last tip I would just say, man, is have a support system. Have a support system. It's important, uh, whether it's wife, you know, whether it's you know a friend that you know who you have. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in having a spiritual um, mentor that can help you to to kind of um, walk through certain things in life. But have a support system. Find someone we can talk to. And I know sometimes it's tough to to tell the persons who are closest to you, especially okay, you might stress them out about what's going on. Right. But I. You know, find a minister, find somebody in your in, in your current body. If you don't have, if you don't have, if you're not a Christian and you don't have somebody in your circle, well, find a church, find someone who can talk to. Because the fundamentals of life have gotten us through as human to where we are is a belief in a deity, and a belief in something that's bigger than us. And whether you're from the Christian faith or other faith, uh, that's our belief that there's supreme power out there. They're going to guide us to the next level. And if we can stay focused and have um, that shepherdness, uh, that shepherd who's going to lead us here and the physical earth to guide us along the way, I think that in itself is going to help us to stay grounded. And in all you do, man, um, give thanks, bro. Just just, just give thanks. And um, for the small things and for the big things, you know? Well, I mean... Cecil, I just want to thank you, man. I really appreciate this. Um, this has been very inspiring. Even for, even for me, like, it's been very inspiring. There's a line you said, you were created not to fail. I mean, that stuck with me. And I love it, man. I really love it. Um, you can. You, what's the website to check out Aim High? Oh, well, it's aimhighei.org. Okay. Aimhighei.org. And I, I also have my own website. It's drcecilwright.com. Um, so it, on there, we have a few videos. Um, um, my book is on Amazon, um, 21 Days of Freedom. And, you know, so we have a couple of things going on. And very soon, we're going to transform the MIEA website to make it a lot more accessible, where folks can get videos and, and materials, all the lectures that we have done, and just kind of get the, the, the materials to, to execute it anywhere across the country. So looking forward to that, you know. But, um, but, man, it's a pleasure, man, talking to you, man. I think um, I'm inspired by what you do, man. And, you know, let's, 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 let's off air. Let's, let's try to um, hook up sometime this week and talk some more about how we can, how we can help you and what you do and, 
and um and, and promote you somewhat and move aim high you know somewhere in your your region too all right definitely man again um I'm always intentional in everything I do, man. I try my best to be, man. So okay, every that. connection, I, I'm trying to make it intent. Because as you said, that support system, I'm trying to build a group of people around me that 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 I feel are, are, are going the right direction. And you are one of them, man. I appreciate it, bro. Man, you're one of those, man. You know, <laughs> one, of, one, my, one, of my, 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 one of my buddy, um, Steve, Dr. Steve Perry, once said, man, we're all on the journey. Sometimes we're running, sometimes we're walking, right? And sometimes we run together, and sometimes you start off and you're running, I'm walking, and another time you get tired, you stop, and then I keep running. But the fact is that we're all the journey together, and if we just stay on that journey, bro, we're gonna get there one day, man. So, man, it's a pleasure. If you need anything, man, hit me up, let me know. Let's do something. All right, man. Have, enjoy all the right. rest of your day, man. Bless you. All right, you too, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. All right, bye. You can also stop by passionbehindtheart.com to listen to past episodes and to learn more about the project. Blessings.